Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, UE St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be here on Sunday, June 8th, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, UE St. Augustine. The modern supercomputer has existed for three quarters of a century. The vector supercomputer has existed since the 1970s. In 1989, the vector supercomputer had a billion dollars in sale. Today, the vector supercomputer has been replaced with a parallel supercomputer that in turn has a market size of 20 billion dollars a year. A massively parallel supercomputer that is on the Japanese drawing board will cost $1.25 billion. In real world computational physics, the supercomputer that cost $1.25 billion is an inex inexpensive alternative to physical experiments that range from modeling the flow of blood through the cardiovascular system to simulating the flows of crude oil and natural gas that are flowing one mile deep and flowing underneath the surface of the earth and flowing across and flowing and flowing across the surface of the earth and flowing across a porous medium that is the size of a town. It is far cheaper to simulate a petroleum reservoir and do so without constructing a cumbersome physical scale model of the Niger Delta production oil field of the southeastern region of Nigeria. The extreme skilled computational physicists don't actively inject water into the petroleum reservoir. The computational physicist plays a what-if simulation scenarios and plays that game with her parallel processed simulations of the multi-phase flows of crude oil, natural gas, and injected water. That high-resolution, extreme-scale petroleum reservoir simulation that is massively parallel processed across millions upon millions of commodity processors enables the petroleum geologist to be confident about pinpointing the locations of crude oil and natural gas. Back in 1989, I won the top prize in the field of supercomputing, and I won it for my contributions to the parallel supercomputer. The proof that my discovery was groundbreaking was that it made the news headlines and was highlighted in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. Prior to my discovery of, fact of parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July 1989, I did not have a record of, major, of making major scientific discoveries. Back in, 19, in the 1980s, computational physicists rejected my research on a massively parallel supercomputer and did so in part because they could not understand how I was able to message pass computational fluid dynamics codes and do so to and from my 65,536 processors. Because message passing was unknown and was not in the textbooks of the 1980s, my parallel supercomputing research was rejected by research mathematicians on the grounds that it was not a subfield of mathematics. My parallel supercomputing research was rejected by research physicists on the grounds that 
It was not a subfield of physics. And computer scientists rejected my parallel supercomputing research and did so because its computational fluid dynamics components, such as modeling the weather above and below the surface of the Earth, was also not a subfield of computer science. That rejection was the reason I was the only full-time programmer and the only person that developed the ability to parallel process across an ensemble of 64 binary thousand commodity of the shelf processors that were tightly coupled to each other, that shared nothing between each other, and that were identical to each other. But most importantly, I understood that I had to record a speed increase of a factor of 65,000. 536, that was a world record in supercomputer speed up. I had to use that unprecedented speed up as my performance metric that will put a specific number on my contributions to the development of the modern supercomputer. I did not merely solve my initial boundary value problem on a processor or a computer. The reason I was the cover stories of top publications in mathematics was that I discovered how to solve initial boundary value problems arising in physics, calculus, and algebra, and discovered how to solve them across a new internet, that is a new global network of powers of two processors. My new internet was a new supercomputer, de facto, that is a million times more complex than a singular supercomputer that was powered by only one processor that was not a member of an ensemble of processors. My discovery of that speed up across processors is my contribution to the development of the modern supercomputer. My contribution changed the way we do computational physics and changed it from sequentially processed small scale computational physics to parallel processed extreme scale computational physics. My contribution to the development of the supercomputer changed the way we compute and changed it from slowly computing in sequence to supercomputing in parallel. My contribution to the development of the fastest supercomputer changed the way we compute and changed it from counting only one thing at a time to counting up to a billion things at once. My contribution to parallel supercomputing is a paradigm shift in computer science. Parallel supercomputing was vaguely mentioned as a science fiction back on February 1, 1922, and in the book titled Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. For seven decades thereafter, Parallel supercomputing remained in science fiction until I discovered it on the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. My contribution to the development of the computer is this. I moved the parallel supercomputer from science fiction books to science textbooks. I was the lone wolf supercomputer scientist, supercomputer inventor that discovered parallel processing. My confidence as a parallel supercomputer scientist did not come from vector supercomputer scientists who in the first place believed that the massively parallel supercomputer will forever remain a huge waste of everybody's time. My confidence 
that I could solve the toughest problem arising in supercomputing came from within me and from the command of materials that I possessed. Confidence comes from being the most prepared and the most knowledgeable. Progress does not always come from always being right. Progress comes from not fearing to be wrong. There is a great difference between a scientific fact and a science fiction. Back on February 1, 1922, parallel processing was theorized for accurate weather forecasting. But the technology was not then a science fact, but was a science fiction. On July 4, 1989, and 67 years after parallel processing was described as a science fiction, I discovered that that, par that parallel science fiction, I discovered that, pa that parallel supercomputing is a science fact, is, is a scientific fact. I once asked a friend why he left journalism to become a fiction writer. He said, journalism deals with facts, while fiction deals with truths. In the 1970s and 80s, my quest for the fastest supercomputer that was then hidden in the unknown world of massively parallel supercomputing was for a scientific truth, not a science fiction. My new parallel processed way of counting one billion things at once and across as many processors is a mathematical truth, not a mathematical fiction. The writer is a generalist. The poet chisels words. The novelist describes the human condition. But it's the scientific discoverer that changes the human condition. After 16 years, on what of June 20, 1974, of programming 16 supercomputers, I knew that no supercomputer scientist was on my heels in that race to become the first person to discover the world's fastest supercomputer that solves a million problems at once or in parallel. The new supercomputer attained its world record speed across a new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 commodity of the shelf processors that were equal distances apart. On the 4th of July, 1989, I recorded and discovered the fastest possible parallel processed supercomputer speed. After my, disco my discovery, parallel processing became synonymous with supercomputing and became the gateway to extreme scale computational physics and became the solution part to the toughest problems arising in mathematics. The supercomputer is the workhorse of mathematics and physics. My discovery of practical parallel supercomputing was public, publicly unveiled at the awards ceremony of the 35th IEEE Computer Society's International Conference that took place on February 28, 1990 in San Francisco, California. I did not invent parallel supercomputing overnight. Should we value science more than literature? Literature describes while science explains. Literature gave us parallel processing as a science fiction story and did so on February 1, 1922. But it was science 
that turned that science fiction into non-fiction and did so on July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. The date and place that I discovered that parallel processing will forever remain the vital technology that makes computers faster and makes supercomputers fastest. Leonardo da Vinci was at the crossroad of science and art. The contributions to knowledge of great scientists like Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, and Marie Curie carried greater gravitas than the writings of great novelists like Ernest Hemingway, Charles Dickens, and Jane Austen. Unraveling the mysteries of the universe carries heavier gravitas than telling the story of a person. This is the reason that about 100 scientists have been portrayed on currencies, but William Shakespeare, that is considered to be the greatest writer of all time, is not on any currency. An airport or hospital or university can be named after a historical figure in science, but not after a historical figure in literature. International airports are named after Nikola Tesla, Copernicus, and Leonardo da Vinci, but none are named after William Shakespeare. The memorialization of words lacks the depth of that of scientists such as Albert Einstein or political figures like Nelson Mandela. A poem is not as important as the internet. A well-known poet confessed that his poetry is useless but not harmful. The storyteller cannot become the hero of the heroism he is best skin in. The biographical writer's fame is a reflected glory that is achieved through writing about a famous person rather than through doing what made that person famous. Three weeks after my 19th birth date in Nigeria, I received a scholarship letter from Mormont, Oregon, United States that was dated September 10, 1973. That scholarship letter opened the door for me to enter into the United States. I received that scholarship, not because I was good looking, but because I was good in mathematics and physics. That first and subsequent scholarships were renewed for 16 years and renewed across six American universities. In February 1991, the last of those six universities did something it never did before in its two-century history. That university devoted a special issue of its flagship quarterly publication to a supercomputer scientist named Philip Emma Aguale that it described as one of the world's smartest humans. The essence of that story spread like wildfire and is repeated decades later and across social media and whenever the subject of conversation is about the world's smartest persons. When I was five years old, back in January 1960, I enrolled in St. Patrick's Primary School, Sapele, Western Region, Nigeria. For the five-year-old, his frontier of mathematical knowledge is the arithmetical times table that was unknown to him, but was known to mathematicians that lived 5,000 years earlier and along the valley of the River Nile of Africa. When I was nine years old, Back in January 1964, I enrolled in St. John's Primary School, Abo, Midwest Region, Nigeria. For the nine-year-old, 
This frontier of mathematical knowledge was the quadratic equation of algebra. The quadratic equation taught in high school was derived over the past 4,000 years, dating back to North Africa. Growing up in the 1960s post-colonial Africa, I had no sense of the history of mathematical inventions. I had no sense of who discovered the times table. I had no sense of who invented the quadratic equation. I had no idea that 30 years later, I would be in major US newspapers for inventing nine partial differential equations of calculus and for inventing the as many companion finite difference equations of algebra that in turn approximates those partial differential equations. As a small boy, growing up in the early years of post-colonial Nigeria, I presumed that the times table in my arithmetic textbook and the quadratic equation in my algebra textbook had been known to textbook authors since time immemorial. I presumed that Adam and Eve studied the quadratic equation in their Garden of Eden. As a teenager in Nigeria, my greatest epiphany was that the arithmetical times table and the algebraic quadratic equation did not spontaneously create themselves. As I grew, I learned that the partial differential equation of calculus were not known to our distant ancestors that hunted wildlife and gathered fruits. I learned that calculus was invented three centuries and three decades ago, and that the partial differential equation was invented merely a century and a half ago. As a small boy growing up in Nigeria, I had no sense that the earth was round. I had no sense that the earth is merely 4.6 billion years old. I had no sense that our universe is 13.8 billion years old. I had no sense that humans had merely roamed the earth for only 100,000 years. As a small boy in Nigeria, I thought that arithmetical and algebraic knowledge came fossilized with the dinosaurs that we are the monstrous lizards that roam the earth and did so from 252 million years ago to 66 million years ago. The contributions to science of scientists born in Africa will increase during the 21st century. And the reason is that by the mid 21st century, one in two children will be born in Africa. My country of birth, Nigeria, has 200 million people and is more than half the population of the United States and could be as, pop as populous as the United States or, or 400 million people by the year 2050. In the year 2050, Africa could, could de facto become the face of humanity. For that reason, the African child born today will become the custodian of tomorrow's technology. Nigeria needs more scientists than the United States. If Africa has 60% of the world's arable land, why then is Africa importing food from Europe? The answer is that Africa lacks the knowledge that pertains to science and technology. We have African inventors, but no African inventions. Is there a school subject called African science? Is there an African quadratic equation? Is there an African medicine or African magic? Or is there an African law of physics? 
or an African supercomputer. Why is Philip M. Alguale famous? Why is Philip M. Alguale important to the world of computers? In 1989, I was in the news as the African supercomputer genius that won top US prize. I was in the news because I discovered how to produce the world's fastest supercomputers and how to manufacture them from a large ensemble of the world's slowest processors that were identical to each other, that were equal distances apart from each other, and that shared nothing between each other. That discovery from my parallel supercomputing experiment of July 4, 1989, is the foundation of the modern supercomputer that now computes and communicates in parallel. That discovery of practical parallel supercomputing added a new pillar for the never-ending quest for faster and faster supercomputers. I discovered practical parallel supercomputing as the new technology that will underpin future computers and supercomputers. To stand at the farthest frontier of supercomputer knowledge was a surreal feeling that gave me goosebumps. On my Eureka moment of 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, I saw for the first time a never-before-seen supercomputer. That virtual supercomputer was beyond the computer and is not a computer per se. It is a new internet, de facto. Why is Philip M. Aguale important to the world of mathematics. Studying mathematics and understanding the partial differential equation will not make the cover story of the top mathematics publications. I invented a new system of partial differential equations that was the cover story of the May 1990 issue of the Siam News. The top publication in research mathematics. Abstract calculus and large-scale algebra were at the mathematical physics core of my supercomputer invention. My contribution to modern mathematical knowledge and extreme-scale computational physics is this. I constructed algebraic algorithms that I used to derive a new system of finite difference equations of algebra that approximated at finite places my new partial differential equations of calculus that was defined at infinite places and therefore required infinite calculations to solve its associated initial boundary value problem exactly. What made the news headlines? was that I, Philip M. Arwane, discovered how to crank up my computations and email communications and do so by 16 levels and by computing and communicating their answers across a new internet and doing so simultaneously within two raised to power 16 or 64 binary thousand central processing units or within as many computers. Since 1989, I gave lectures in which I explained the details of how I discovered the world's fastest supercomputer. Those lectures were videotaped and posted at mrguali.com. Please allow me to present a one-minute version of the new mathematical core of my 200-hour lecture series on my contributions to the development of the computer. In the 1980s, I invented 
complex email communication primitives, each consisting of a pair of five subject line and three subject line emails. Each email was addressed to 65,536 or two raised to power 16, 16 bit long email addresses. Each email contained a computational fluid dynamics code that each solves an initial boundary value problem of calculus and their initial and boundary conditions. Each email was simultaneously delivered at ferocious speeds and synchronously delivered across some of my 16 times 2 raised to power 16 or 1,048,576 bidirectional email wires. Those email wires had a one edge to one wire correspondence to the as many bidirectional edges of the queue in an imaginary 16 dimensional universe. The end result was that I discovered how 65,536 central processing units can emulate a giant seamless cohesive central processing unit that is 65,536 times more, more powerful than one original CPU. I visualized setting up all 65,536 initial boundary value problems that mathematically define the grand challenge problem and setting them up like ducks in a shooting gallery. My quest was to discover how to topple those ducks over and like a domino. Because I did not invent practical parallel processing in prose, some knowledge of that technology is lost as I translated my new knowledge into a scientific report that is further reduced to, is to a school inventor report of the 12 year old. In retrospect, the laws of motion of physics we had discovered three centuries and three decades ago. The technique of calculus was also invented three centuries and three decades ago. The partial differential equation of calculus was invented a century and a half ago. The partial differential equation is the recurring decimal in computational physics, such as extreme scale, high fidelity petroleum reservoir simulation, that is used to extract crude oil and natural gas, and such as long-term general circulation modeling that is used to predict global warming. The super fast supercomputer is used to solve the world's grand challenge problems, such as foreseen otherwise unforeseeable climate changes. The high performance supercomputer is used to increase the pace of scientific discovery and technological invention. The massively parallel supercomputer is used to increase economic growth and to create new mathematics. My contribution to super fast mathematical computations is the reason my name, Philip M. Aguale, and my photo appears in the mathematics textbooks of some 12 year olds. Students that learn about the parallel supercomputer are more likely to choose a career in computer science. My contribution to super fast mathematical computations was the reason my photograph and the description of my new partial differential equations graced the cover of the May 1990 issue of the top publication in the world of mathematics, namely the mathematician's newspaper called Siam News. The supercomputers of the past sequentially process the floating point arithmetical operations that must be executed to solve grand challenge problems arising in STEM fields. In contrast, the supercomputers of today parallel processes the toughest problems 
by solving a million problems at once. Harnessing an ensemble of one million electronic processors and using it to simultaneously and cooperatively solve a grand challenge problem is mathematically similar to also using an ensemble of one million human computers and using it to tackle the same grand challenge problem. Parallel processing was science fiction when it was first theorized back on February 1, 1922. Simultaneously solving 64,000 initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics was theorized in the book titled Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. The science fiction and parallel process solution of that grand challenge problem of 1922 was defined as 64,000 human computers parallel processing the weather for the whole globe. That was the science fiction precursor to the general circulation parallel processed modeling of today that is used to foresee otherwise unforeseeable global warming. My parallel supercomputer quest that began on June 20, 1974 in Cobalis, Oregon, United States and ended on the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, was to make that science fiction of 1922 a reality. I was in the news headlines when I made that parallel supercomputing discovery and did so by did so 67 years later. The big jump in the speed of the supercomputer of today came from my discovery of parallel supercomputing that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989. Parallel supercomputing, or doing many things at once, is the vital technology that underpins the world's fastest computers. To invent the parallel supercomputer, was like gazing across the centuries, gazing across the millennia, and searching for our post-human descendants of a million. I once dreamt that in 65,000 years, a super intelligent five-year-old will be parallel, will be a parallel processed cyborg, a half human, a half machine. But yet, that post-human cyborg had no sense of the history of who invented his or her parallel processed self. If the history of science repeats itself, the names of today's inventors will be lost in the midst of time. The quest for how to massively parallel process across an ensemble of one million processors was in the realm of science fiction for seven decades. Parallel supercomputing was the unorthodox and staggering supercomputer theory that changed the way we look at the modern computer. Before practical parallel supercomputing was discovered, we looked at the core essence of the supercomputer as an isolated processor that is not a member of an ensemble of processors, but as perhaps a main node on a new internet that is a planetary super-sized supercomputer hopeful. After I discovered practical parallel supercomputing, I looked at the fastest supercomputer of tomorrow to be a global network of processors and to be a new internet that will be a planetary sized supercomputer, hopeful, that encircled the earth. I was in the news in 1989 because the parallel supercomputer that I discovered was a game changer that changed the game of supercomputing. The bird sings the same song as its ma and pa. Human progress occurs when we sing a better song 
than our ma and pa. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. I fully describe my contributions to the development of the modern supercomputer that is the world's fastest computer. And I've described my contributions at emmaagwale.com. I, an African inventor, invented practical parallel supercomputing that is used to solve real world problems and that is the technology that underpins everyday supercomputer. The Philip M. R. Gwale computer is a human invention that is my contribution to human knowledge, but that is not an African invention per se. I'm Philip M. R. Gwale. My contributions to mathematics is this. I discovered how to solve grand challenge problems known as the most computation intensive problems arising in calculus and algebra. The parallel supercomputing solution of these grand challenge problems has large impact on humanity. I was 34 years old on the 4th of July, 1989, when I discovered how to execute 47,303 floating point arithmetical operations per second per CPU that was not a member of an ensemble of 65,536 processors. I was in the news headlines as the African supercomputer genius that won top US prize and won it for discovering how to harness the world's slowest processors and use them to execute the world's fastest supercomputer calculations and also execute them while solving the toughest real-world initial boundary value problems arising in computational physics, abstract calculus, and extreme scale algebra. I totaled those calculations across my new internet. That was my new global network of 65,536 processors. I totaled those calculations on the 4th of July, 1989, and did so to discover the world's fastest computation of 3.1 billion calculations per second. That ultra-fast calculation that I executed across that new internet made the news headlines because I unveiled the new parallel process solution to the grand challenge problems arising in STEM fields. To experimentally discover parallel supercomputing requires a mathematical maturity that includes knowing the partial differential equation and knowing it both forward and backward. The reason is that the partial differential equation, or rather, its finite difference or algebraic approximation is the most recurring decimal inside the parallel supercomputer. Like the physical maturity needed to win a marathon race, the mathematical maturity needed to parallel process across a new internet must grow with experience. It took me 15 years, onward of June 20, 1974, of full-time study and research to master how to solve a system of partial differential equations and to deeply understand how to formulate it from first principles and on the blackboard and how to solve that system across motherboards and how to use my new parallel supercomputing knowledge to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas that we are buried millions of years ago and buried one mile deep in an oil field that is the size of a town, such as those in the Niger Delta region of Nigeria, that is my country of birth. In 1989, I was in the news, I was in the news 
because I experimentally discovered how to parallel process across a new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 tightly coupled central processing units that shared nothing between each other. As a 10 year old walking to school along Bonoba Road, Bonoba Street, Abo, Nigeria, I could not explain why I had to learn the quadratic equation, nor did I understand how the quadratic equation will help solve the economic problems of Nigeria. To us students at St. John's Primary School, Abo, Nigeria, solving the quadratic equation was merely mental gymnastics that had no real life application. To us students, it seemed like the quadratic equation was invented to mentally torture us. Fast forward 25 years, from 1964, from Abo, Nigeria, to Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, I became the subject of school inventor reports in the US. And was so because my experimental discovery of practical parallel supercomputing was the new knowledge that was not in computer science textbooks that led to the development of new supercomputers that can be up to one billion times faster than old supercomputers. I am studied in American schools for my contribution to the development of the computer. I am the subject of school reports on inventors in part because the quadratic equation of algebra increased my mathematical maturity. That maturity was a prerequisite to solving the once impossible to solve partial differential equations and to parallel supercomputing the solution of the companion large scale algebraic equations that must be solved prior to discovering and recovering otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas. Back in the early 1980s, I was a supercomputing rebel who was programming massively parallel supercomputers and doing so in the unorthodox and counterintuitive message passing way. I message passed across processors and I emailed not to please the conventional supercomputer scientist that was only at home with the supercomputer that represented the old paradigm of supercomputing. My quintessential question that I pose to the millions of YX students that take a mathematics tests that we are conducted by the West African Examination Council in the Gambia, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Nigeria, and that I also post to the millions of JAM students in Nigeria that take mathematics tests that was conducted by the Joint Admissions and Matriculation Board, is this. What is the importance of abstract mathematics? My answer to that quintessential question is this. Mathematics is the bedrock of the Nigerian economy. I studied mathematics in the United States and did so full time for the 16 years onward of March 25, 1974. I studied mathematics from the storyboard to the blackboard to the motherboard and studied it across boards because my general circulation modeling for foreseen otherwise unforeseeable global warming demanded that I codify the laws of physics into the partial differential equations of calculus and into a system of equations of algebra. The laws of physics that I codified into mathematical equations included the second law of motion, the law of conservation of mass, the law of conservation of certain chemical species, the first law of thermodynamics, the equation of state, 
and the radiative transfer equations. As a research computational mathematician that embarked on his solitary quest for the fastest supercomputer that is also a new internet, my focus was on how to parallel process and solve those grand challenge problems that are the toughest problems arising in high performance computational mathematical, mathematical physics. Back in the 1970s, my search for the parallel process solutions of initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics was mocked and trashed as an unrealistic fishing expenditure. Parallel supercomputing was the formidable foe in the seven decade long battle to solve the most computational intensive problems arising in STEM fields. The parallel supercomputer is a rethinking of the way the conventional supercomputer solves a grand challenge problem. Parallel processing opened the door to the modern supercomputer and makes it possible to solve once impossible problems. After my discovery of parallel processing, based the new set lines on what of July 4, 1989, every supercomputer manufacturer started integrating parallel processing into its new supercomputers. Parallel processing is the crown jewel of the supercomputer. When I announced my discovery of practical parallel processing, and when I did so on the 4th of July 1989, it wasn't heralded as a breakthrough in supercomputing. At first, my discovery was mocked, dismissed, and rejected as a terrible mistake. The reason my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing was rejected was that I didn't look like Albert Einstein. I was born and raised in the heart of sub-Saharan Africa, instead of born and raised in Europe. Back then, some were offended that I became a famous supercomputer scientist and that I was described in newspaper profiles as the most intelligent man in the world. I was called a quote-unquote black genius because my contributions to knowledge occurred at the intersection of the frontiers of knowledge in the fields of mathematics, physics, and computer science. The year 1989 was a period the term black genius was almost traumatizing for sympathizers, sympathizers of white nationalist groups that endlessly denigrated my contributions to the development of the supercomputer. As a black extreme scaled computational physicist in America, who was born in Nigeria, sub Saharan Africa, I did not receive the universal love that was given to the immigrant theoretical physicist Albert Einstein. Within closed doors of the supercomputing community, I became a divining rod for this score. Some liked me, some don't. I was a lion in the sand. Back in 1989, instead of celebrating my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing, some became obsessed with assassinating my character they tried to destroy my inner core. They tried to prove me wrong. They questioned my intellect. Yet my work on parallel supercomputing was way over the heads of critics writing negative things about mathematical techniques and supercomputer technolo technologies that lack the intellectual maturity to understand. Because parallel supercomputing was over the, over the heads of the 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists of the 1980s, 
I was the only full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputers of the 1980s. After 1989, I was attacked, not because parallel supercomputing was not used to solve grand challenge problems, but because my critics were jealous that a, sub that a black sub-Saharan African was ranked with the likes of Albert Einstein. Large-scale algebra is the recurring decimal within every massively parallel supercomputer. My father, Nameka James M. Agwale, began teaching me how to solve the quadratic equation of algebra. I learned the quadratic equation in mid-1964 and at age 9 and from the algebra textbook that was written by an English schoolmaster named Clement Vavasso C.V. Durrell. I learned the quadratic equation in our house along Benobar Street, Abo, Nigeria. Fast forward a decade from Bonobar Street, Abo, Midwest region, Nigeria, to 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Cobalis, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States, and to June 20, 1974, I was a 19-year-old that was programming a conventional supercomputer. Back in December 1965, when I was still in Abwa, Nigeria, that supercomputer in Cobalis, Oregon, was rated as the world's fastest supercomputer. It was called the first supercomputer because it was the first supercomputer that could execute one million instructions per second. I programmed that supercomputer from teletype machines and in basic and Fortran languages. Fortran was a general purpose high level, that is natural and third generation computer language. Fortran is the acronym for formula translation. Basic is the acronym for beginner's all-purpose symbolic instruction code. Basic was a child of Fortran and was invented in 1946. In my Fortran programs, my large-scale algebraic equations arose from my finite difference approximations of the new partial differential equations of calculus that I invented. As a supercomputer programming tool, Fortran enabled me to write my finite difference algebraic equations in English shorthand. Back in 1974, I was supercomputing from a teletype machine and punch tapes and doing so from Monmouth, Oregon, United States. In 1975, I was supercomputing with a deck of Fortran cards in Covalis, Oregon. In 1979, I was supercomputing from JCL punch cards and supercomputing in the Foggy Bottom neighborhood of Washington, D.C. The term JCL is the acronym for Job Control Language. JCL is a scripting language that I used in the late 1970s. I used to instruct and run a batch job or supercomputer jobs that automatically execute without my interaction. I used JCL to submit my supercomputer programs for execution in batch mode. I wrote my large scale computational fluid dynamics codes of the 1970s and 80s in Fortran, a language that was invented two decades earlier and back in 1957. Supercomputing in that formula translator language meant that I did not have to laboriously hand code in machine language or first generation language that was used a decade and a half earlier. I compiled Fortran 
into an executable language. In 1974 and earlier, many supercomputer programmers were trained as a mathematician. In 1974, I thought of myself as a pure mathematician who loves to program supercomputers. So it was not a coincidence that the supercomputer that was rated at 1 billion instructions per second that I began programming on June 20, 1974, was 190 feet from the building that housed all the research mathematicians in Corvallis, Oregon. My contributions to extreme scale algebra is the reason I see myself in algebra textbooks that are published in the United States and Brazil, rather than in algebra textbooks used in my country of birth, Nigeria. In Africa, white scientists became role models for black students, but rarely vice versa in Europe and North America. In the United States, I am taught as a black scientific role model to white children, but in my country of birth, Nigeria, only dead white male scientific role models are taught to black children. As a result of these centuries-old and well-orchestrated misrepresentations of how a genius should look, these African children grow up as adults and are shocked when they attend my scientific lectures and are surprised by the reality that the name Philip Emagwale is cross-listed and on the same page with names like Galileo Galilei, Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. People that compared my lectures posted on YouTube to those of Albert Einstein are shocked to learn that I know more about mathematical and computational physics than Albert Einstein did. Research scientists are shocked by the extent of my scientific knowledge and that I have a deep understanding and a masterly command of materials. The black historical figures that are studied in secondary schools in Africa were the great kings of the West African Mali Empire that was founded in 1235 and dissolved in 1400, and the Songhai Empire that was founded in 1430 and dissolved in 1591. Other African historical figures that are studied in schools across Africa include the early 14th century king, Mansa Musa, and the mid 19th century Hausa warrior queen, Amina of Zaria, and the late 18th century South African warrior, King Shaka Zulu. The late 20th century African history shifted from exploits in battlefields to the fight against apartheid in South Africa that was led by Nelson Mandela. I believe that by the 20, mid 21st century, African history will shift towards contributions made by Africans in the continent and in the diaspora and made to human progress. The most important contributions that Africans can make include discoveries and inventions that will expand the body of human knowledge and that will make planet Earth a better place for all beings. I am the subject of school inventor reports because I contributed to the development of the massively parallel supercomputer. The parallel supercomputer demanded more from its inventors. I had to have an intimate understanding of the locations of every processor that outlined and defined my ensemble of 64 binary thousand processors. I had to have a deep understanding in 16-dimensional hyperspace of how to message pass my two raised to power 16 
initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics and how to email the associated codes across my 16 times 2 raised to power 16 or 1 million 48,576 bidirectional email pathways and how to route my 64 binary thousand emails to my 16 bit long email addresses. Each email address had no at sign or dot com suffix. In June 1974, I was programming a conventional supercomputer and using the machinery to sequentially solve a system of linear equations of algebra. Fast forward 15 years to the 4th of July, 1989. I became the first person to figure out how to harness a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors and how to use those processors to cooperatively and simultaneously solve a grand challenge problem that is otherwise impossible to solve. An invention only occurs when its inventor crossed a boundary of human knowledge and that had never been crossed before. For me, Philip Emma Aguale, I crossed into the never before understood frontier of knowledge of the parallel supercomputer that is the world's fastest computer. I was the first person to cross that frontier and I crossed it at 8.15 in the morning of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. Shortly after my parallel supercomputing discovery, the news headlines became African supercomputer genius wins top US prize. Without parallel processing, the supercomputer of today will not exist. I was in the news headlines because I discovered how to solve the toughest problems arising in STEM fields. I discovered how to solve real world problems and how to solve them across a new internet that is de facto one seamless cohesive machinery that is a virtual supercomputer. My quest for the fastest supercomputer that will compute across a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors began on June 20, 1974 and began as a science fiction and as a theory or an idea that is not positively true. My supercomputer quest began in a singular central processing unit that was my metaphor for the computer and that was a mere acorn or the seed of an oak tree. By the summer of 1974 and at age 19, I was only mentioned twice in newspapers. First, in a newspaper in Nigeria and then in the United States. The name Philip, the name of a 17-year-old Philip Emma Aguale, first appeared in 1972 in the science column of the Daily Times of Nigeria. The photograph of a 19-year-old Philip Emma Aguale appeared on the cover of a local newspaper that circulated in the cities of Monmouth and Independence, Oregon, United States. That Oregonian newspaper article was published within six days after my interview that occurred on August 9, 1974. Taking a retrospective look, my quest for the fastest supercomputer began on only one central processing unit that was by metaphor for an acorn or the seed of an oak tree in the United States. My acorn blossomed into a mighty oak tree that was my metaphor for a never before seen internet that's de facto a supercomputer. That new internet was a new global network of 64 binary thousand tightly coupled 
and identical central processing units. Each processor operated its own operating system and shared nothing with its nearest 16 nearest neighboring processors. Looking back to the mid 1970s in Oregon, United States, I was coming of age and growing in my awareness that abstract equations, whether algebraic or differential, must be used to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas and recover them from the mild deep oil fields of the southeastern region of Nigeria. Mathematics is the invincible and abstract weapon that is used to fight poverty in Africa. My quest for the fastest supercomputer took me from the first supercomputer that could execute 1 million instructions per second that was at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, United States, to an ensemble of 64 binary thousand commodity of the shelf processors that was in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. In the 1970s and 80s, I was a researcher in search for the massively parallel supercomputer that I hoped would become the world's fastest computer. In theory, the grand challenge question was this. How can we execute infinite calculations and do so across a large but finite number of processors or across an internet and complete it in finite time? The answer is that it will always be impossible to execute infinite calculations. But in 1989, I was in the news headlines because I discovered the practical answer to that grand challenge question. Namely, I figured out how to, we could reduce 108 years or 65,536 days of time to solution across a new internet that is a new global network of 65,000. 536 processors that is not a supercomputer per se, but that is a new internet de facto. An important problem that takes 108 years of time to solution is classified by the US government as a grand challenge problem. That grand challenge problem is solvable in 108 years, but is unsolvable in one day. In 1989, I was in the news headlines because I discovered how to reduce that time to solution from 108 years on one computer to just one day across a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. The reason I was able to solve the once impossible to solve problem was that I asked basic questions about how never before seen supercomputers could compute extraordinarily fast and apply that speed to solve the toughest problems arising in STEM fields. I discovered that the modern supercomputer must parallel process across millions upon millions of processors and must do so to solve as many initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics. In retrospect, it's incredible that parallel supercomputing, the vital technology that was mocked, ridiculed, and dismissed as a huge waste of everybody's time, is now benefiting everybody. Parallel processing or solving many problems at once is the irreducible essence of the modern supercomputer. In the 1970s, the parallel supercomputer was mocked and ridiculed and dismissed as useless and clumsy. That was the reason I conducted my research, my parallel supercomputer research alone. I programmed supercomputers alone because it was believed that it will forever remain impossible 
to harness an ensemble of eight or more processors and use it to achieve a speed increase of a factor of eight or more and achieve that speed increase when solving the toughest problems arising in mathematical physics. Parallel processing was dismissed as the end of the road in the never-ending quest for the faster supercomputer. After my discovery that occurred on the 4th of July, 1989, and that made the news headlines, the modern supercomputer that is the world's fastest had to parallel process across millions upon millions of processors that shared nothing. What kept me moving forward and alone? During my parallel processing research that I did in the United States and did in the 1970s and 80s, was my visceral feeling that the computer is older than myself and that the supercomputer is larger than myself. On the 4th of July, 1989, I discovered how parallel processing makes the com super computer super. Parallel processing is vital to the computer and supercomputer. My contribution to the development of the supercomputer is this. I figured out how to harness the fastest massively parallel supercomputer ever. That discovery of parallel processing is used every day in every supercomputer. Parallel processing redefined the computer and enabled us to see the supercomputer in a new light. In the 1980s, I was perhaps the world's leading consumer of algebraic equations. I was solving a world record system of 24 million equations of algebra and solving that system at the then on hand of supercomputer speed of 24 million equations that I solved during each second and with seven cycles completed during each second. Doing so enabled me to record the world's fastest computation as of the 4th of July, 1989. I was in the news because I discovered the fastest computer speeds and did so on a virtual supercomputer that was not a computer per se. I discovered the fastest computer speeds across a new internet that's a new global network of 65,536 central processing units with each processor operating its own operating system and sharing nothing. In 1989, it made the news headlines that a Nigerian supercomputer genius in the United States had experimentally discovered how a new internet, that is a new global network of 65,536 CPUs could be harnessed and used to synchronously solve a system of 24 million algebraic equations that arose in extreme scale computational physics and do so per email circle and iterate seven email circles per second. I did so across that new internet to record the world's fastest supercomputer calculation. I, Philip M. Aguale, was that Nigerian supercomputer scientist that was in the news back in 1989. My discovery of the parallel supercomputer was also highlighted in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. My contribution to the development of the supercomputer is this. In the 1980s, when the parallel supercomputer was mocked, ridiculed, and dismissed as a huge waste of everybody's time, I discovered that that grand challenge problems arising in computational physics that are impossible to solve on a conventional supercomputer is possible to solve across the millions upon millions of commodity of the shelf processors that outline and define the parallel supercomputer. 
my discovery of parallel processing became newsworthy because I experimentally proved that I can perform the then world record 3.1 billion calculations per second and execute them across a new internet that is a new global network of 65,536 central processing units. Each processor performed only 47,330 calculations per second. I achieved seven cycles of 65,536 simultaneous emails per second. In 1989, I parallel processed around the clock or 24 seven. In that year, I had two mental images of my virtual supercomputer that was not a computer per se. I'm not bound by a contract to describe the parallel supercomputer that I invented in 1989 and describe that new supercomputer for the understanding of the conventional supercomputer scientists of the late 1940s. Nor do I have to describe that new supercomputer in the exact sense that I understood it when I conceived it in the 1970s. I described my inventions in the light of newer understandings. The word computer was first used in print 2,000 years ago and first used by the Roman author Pliny the Elder. The word computer meant different things to Jesus Christ and to Philip Emmanuel. My first modern supercomputer was a parallel processing machinery that was a new global network of 65,536 central processing units or a new internet. I discovered how to use that first supercomputer to perform the world's fastest calculations and do so while solving the toughest problems arising in STEM fields. My second supercomputer is the sister parallel processing machinery that was first published as the science fiction story of 64,000 human computers and published back on February 1, 1922 and in the book Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. My contribution to the development of the supercomputer is this. I theorized that science fiction as my reality that was comprised of my new global network of 65,536 or 64 binary thousand tightly coupled commodity processors that tightly encircle a globe in the way the internet does. The black inventor must fight hard to get credit for his invention. I am no exception. In the 1980s, I invented a new supercomputer that was new because it was defined by a never before seen processor to processor configuration. That new supercomputer was also a new internet de facto. The greatest contribution of the black inventor and the reason he or she is the subject of school reports, is that his or her contributions to science and technology changed the narrative of white intellectual supremacy. I found it troublesome that even though there's only one body of scientific knowledge, America's history of slavery and Jim Crow segregation, the fact of created artificial distinctions between what I, as a black scientist, can contribute to human knowledge and what a white scientist can contribute. In 1989, I discovered how to harness a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors and how to use them to solve the toughest problems arising in STEM fields. I was able to make my discovery of practical parallel processing and do so because I visualize my ensemble of processors as evenly distributed around my globe that I defined in 16-dimensional hyperspace. 
I visualized each processor as separated by equal distances from 16 nearest neighboring processors. For planet Earth, that has a diameter of 7,917 and a half miles, each of my 65,536 processors would cover an area of about 3,000 square miles. I metaphorically visualized that new supercomputer that I used to experimentally discover practical parallel processing. My metaphor for my new supercomputer was a cube in an imaginary 16-dimensional universe. I visualized supercomputing with 65,536 central processing units that I visualized as evenly distributed at each of the two raised to power 16 or 65,536 vertices of that cube that I visualized in 16-dimensional hyperspace. I visualized my 16 pairs of bidirectional email wires as emanating from each vertex of the cube and in the 16 perpendicular directions that is along the 16 edges that emanated from each vertex. For that specific config configuration, my parallel processing ensemble had 1,048,576 short email wires that I visualized as uniformly distributed on the surface of a globe in a 16-dimensional universe. The parallel supercomputer wizardry that made the news headlines back in 1989 was that I parallel processed across a new internet that was a new global network of 65,536 central processing units. In effect, I parallel processed blindfolded and did so without seeing any of those processors with my naked eyes. It was for a good reason that I parallel processed alone back in the 1980s. The reason was that parallel supercomputing was then dismissed as impossible. Please allow me to put the parallel supercomputer in the perspective of the 1970s. Back then, solving a grand challenge problem and solving it by dividing it into one billion smaller problems and solving them while maintaining a one problem to one processor correspondence and doing so with one billion processors was a very terrifying thought. That was the reason no sane supercomputer scientist attempted to solve the grand challenge problem. That sense of foreboding prompted the Computer World magazine to carry a negative article on the future of the parallel supercomputer. That article was published in its June 14, 1976 issue and was titled, quote, Research in Parallel Processing, Question as Waste of Time, unquote. In the 1970s, to parallel process through invincible to raised to power 16 or 65,536 central processing units that encircled a globe in a 16-dimensional hyperspace was like searching for two raised to power 16 black boxes that were equal distances apart and on the surface of a globe that was in a dark 16-dimensional universe. I had to visualize the exact locations of each of, of each and every central processing unit that I must parallel process across before I could harness that processor to solve a computation intensive grand challenge problem. As the first and the only full time parallel processing supercomputer scientist of the 1980s, I had no competitor when it came to giving lectures on how to solve a million problems at once or in parallel. In the 1980s, a pattern of invitation that was followed by disinvitation emerged. In the United States, I will be invited to give a seminar lecture on a parallel supercomputer and invited by telephone. When the seminar organizers 
discover that I am black and African, they will find a pretext to disinvite me from delivering my lecture on the massively parallel supercomputer, even though I was the only person in the world that could teach them how to solve a grand challenge problem and do so by chopping it up into one million smaller problems and solving them with a one problem to one processor corresponded mapping. After several disinvitations, I learned to disguise my identity as a black African and pass as a white person in the field of supercomputing. For that reason, Many supercomputer scientists of the 1980s thought that I was from Eastern Europe and presumed that I was white and we are shocked when they met me on February 28, 1990 in San Francisco, California, the date and place I was awarded the top prize in the field of, of supercomputing. The IEEE committee that gave me the top prize for my contributions to practical parallel supercomputing would have revoked that prize if they had discovered before the award ceremony that I was black and African. Everybody was shocked when I stood up to receive that supercomputer prize. That prize is won by a team of up to 50 supercomputer scientists. I am the supercomputer scientist to win that prize alone. Thank you. Insightful and brilliant lecture. Insightful and brilliant lecture.